Welcome everybody to Real Talk. John Bush here, one of the founders of Real. I'm joined by my partner, Keith McCoy. And today we're super excited to have the pleasure to speak a little bit more with Dr. Brannick Riggs. And we're going to get into some engaging conversation. Uh, he is, I would say, a really, um, his mind is very expansive. He's willing to look at things in a very creative way, uh, not a very traditional way. And I like the way that his brain works. And he's also super, super passionate about what we're doing here with real, uh, with men in general in the world and the way that we show up. So Dr. Riggs, thanks for being here and on today's Real Talk. Absolutely thrilled to be here. Thank you for the invitation, gentlemen. What an honor. My pleasure. Our pleasure. We'll kick it off with just a quick question. Um, yeah. If we have, if you were to put everybody, all the men out there in a big group, a big kind of um, commonality study, and you had to pick, what are some of the top things that you see men dealing with the most physically first? Uh, from a physical standpoint, part of the biggest challenge with men uh, from, from a physician's perspective is that they don't often seek counsel from a physician. Most of the time when they're coming in for a physical, it's often because their wife has sent them in. <laughs> and, and I usually kid with them. I say, well, that's one of two reasons. Either she loves you and wants you to stick around or you don't have enough life insurance. So one of two reasons she's encouraging you to come here today, but men just don't think, you know what I ought to do today? I ought to go see the doctor and check on my health and see how I'm doing and see where I'm headed. It's just not kind of top of mind for us. And thankfully, most of us have sisters, mothers, spouses in our lives that for them, it's a little bit more present and they encourage us to, hey, you know, usually it's they encourage us by saying, you have an appointment Thursday with your doctor for a physical. Like, <laughs> right. Right. <laughs> okay, great. You know, <laughs> I love I love that. Let's let's dig deeper. So where did that come from? Where do you think that that like root of that is from? Because I feel like in my own personal life, that was conditioned in me for a very long time as a man. It was I was almost rewarded for showing up when like a problem needed fixing or there was something specific. So I was kind of conditioned, I would say, in a sense, to show up in this reactionary state versus being trained and conditioned to be proactive especially about my health but what do you see where do you think that comes from i think maybe it comes from you know when we're little particularly of of, of my generation i'll just say my because i think i'm just slightly older than the two of you but um in my generation when you know you as a as a boy you're crying you're hurt whatever it's like come on suck it up you're okay and get up and, and let's move on, which means that then we're conditioned to not really focus on uh, how we feel. It's uh, that is irrelevant. And I have to get back to the task at hand. Yeah. Whereas often with little girls, we're a little bit more coddling with them. And that's not a bad term. I mean, oh, my, you know, sure. I, and I'm saying my daughter gets hurt. Like I will be right there. What's going mm -hmm. on? How can I help? Tell me about it. Right. And um, and sometimes with boys, we don't give them that ability to say, well, tell me about how you got hurt and tell me what's going on. And so our own health and our physical symptoms almost become irrelevant to our task driven life, which is what we're we're so focused mm -hmm. on, particularly as males of get this done, get this done, get this done on and on. And we tend to be in our thought process very singularly focused I, I tell my wife she's, she's amazing but she because she's omnipresent meaning she knows where all the kids are she knows what's planned for dinner she knows like what's in the fridge that she can make for dinner. like that is not even you know not even how I think I think I'm going to get this done and when it's done I'll I'll put my head up and go now what's the next thing yeah and then I'll get that thing done um, so we're wired a little bit differently sometimes. And so I think when women are a little bit more omnipresent, they are thinking about, oh, my husband needs to get a physical. And we, which are very singularly focused, aren't thinking about it because we're so focused on, again, the task at hand and getting things done. Yeah, I think I find a lot of men would rather do just about anything than have to face the challenges that they have. Yeah. Right. 
Because even when they do come in, then they're left with whatever prognosis, whatever recommendations, whatever lifestyle changes need to be made. And then do you see that they're often taking that advice or are they just, they're going, they're showing up, they're placating their wife and then they're going about their day-to-day lives? Uh, I would say that I get probably it's a 70-30 mix. You know, I mean, Mm -hmm. we're we tend to not be as compliant as females are um, in the direction. Um, I'm I'm not sure where that comes from, whether it's, you know, uh, you know, we're, we're more directive and maybe feel like we're more in charge. So therefore we don't take counsel from the physician. Yeah. But about 30% of men really are like, okay, I'm here. I'm showing up. If I'm here, I may as well take the counsel that yeah. you're going to give me and I'm going to make those changes. But sometimes too, though, the, as men, far more than women, you're presenting them with data. So for instance, I have a had a patient some time ago that came in, thought he was completely healthy. We did a bunch of labs. His blood sugar was 430. By wow. the way, normal's 100 or less. Wow. His was 430. And I said, you're a type 2 diabetic. And he said, no, I'm not. <laughs> I said, yeah, we, here's the data. This is what's going on. This is what your system is doing. And even when I sent him to the dietitian to have some, you know, some education on what things to eat, what things to stay away from, et cetera, he walked in and said, Dr. Rigg says I'm diabetic, but I'm not. And so I'm just following up on this because he said I have to. Yeah. Well, the data would indicate that you are. <laughs> And maybe with just some acceptance that we are, we're not infallible. We can have things happen to us. We can get sick. We can have problems. Recognizing that and saying, all right, I'm going to accept this and I'm going to move on and figure out what to do about it. Do you think there's a correlation between that mindset and what you were talking about? Like the suck it up, the like, because I think what happens, my own theory on this, um, Mm. and I have two boys and and, and a bunch of daughters, um, (laughs) But my own theory on this is that when we raise our sons in that in that environment and we tell them to suck it up and we don't ask them how they feel or we don't give them the opportunity to to really learn and understand their emotions, they don't learn how to deal with fear. And then as adult men, when I go to the doctor and he tells me that I have something I need to be paying attention to, whether it's blood sugar, cholesterol, you know, I'm I'm a diabetic, I, I'm I'm leaning towards diabetes. I think what happens is immediately fear sets in because Mm -hmm. we don't know how to deal with that. And because we don't know how to deal with it, we just go, I'm not going to deal with it. (laughs) Right. Like that's my theory on that. And so part of what we're trying to do is help guys to understand that, like, it's okay to, to like, we are in fact, we are fallible. We are going to have things that come to us, whether they're environmental threats or whether they're, you know, physical. Cause it seems like we're fine going for physical injury. Like right. I'll go reset an arm. I'll go right. check my rolled ankle. Yeah. But don't tell me I have to quit eating steak. Every right. Night. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. Or I've got to put down the ice cream every night or don't yeah. tell me I've, I've got to go out and, and run, you know? Right. Yeah. Cause I, I don't want to, I don't want to deal with those things and the potential consequences of if I don't. Yeah. Yeah. I agree. It's interesting. yeah. How do you, how do you um think that that lends into uh, I kind of have two questions. One is about mental health, but also um, I was reading up on your bio and just just getting you know refreshed with all the accolades that you have and the, the oh. years that you've been board certified and, uh-huh. and all the things that you've done. And, and my favorite phrase that I, that I read was that you are passionate about changing your profession. Yeah. And, yeah. and I like disruption. I think John likes disruption. Part of why sure. we do what we do is to shift the narrative. Yeah. Um, so that really caught my my attention. I'd love you to to share um, more about that. Thank you. Uh, I, I so to talk about that, let me just share with you some of my background. So I grew up uh, living in lots of places around the world. So not just the United States. We lived in the Middle East for a little while and. Yeah, uh, just outside of Tehran, Iran. We lived there for a little over two years. Um, we spent time in Hong Kong. We spent time in in Europe. Um, and because of that, our uh, culture of health and healing in our home was really broad. 
Um, we, we saw chiropractors and acupuncturists and acupressurists, and we did herbals and vitamins and um, all sorts of things along with traditional medicine. But then when I went to medical school in the first year of medical school, I realized that I was being taught a very narrow view of, of health and wellness. And I kind of say that tongue in cheek because really we weren't taught health and wellness. We were taught illness. And then here's the pharmaceutical that goes with the illness. Now I'm not saying that we don't need pharmaceuticals. I think, thank heavens that, that there were wise people that have, figured out some chemistry to help us and deal with things like sepsis and surgery and those sorts of things. But to say that's all there is, which seemed to me that's what medical school was teaching me. I was really disenchanted with that. Interesting. Um, because of that, I I went to my, my advisor and said, look, where's the rest of the information? Because I know that there are other ways to approach health and wellness. And he said, well, you might want to go and talk with a gentleman by the name of Andrew Weil, Dr. Andrew Weil. He was new to our medical school for a couple of years, and he headed up the complementary and alternative medicine department at the University of Arizona. And so um, he said, you might want to go talk to him. So I went and talked to Dr. Weil and expressed my concern with him. And he said, you're right. There is so much more. And Dr. Weil is a Harvard-trained physician. He, after, after medical school, went and traveled the world, interacting with medicine men and shaman and, and um, tribal and cultural medicine, learning a bunch of modalities that we don't even discuss in medical school. And so he said, well, I just started a fellowship. Um, it's a one-year fellowship for people after residency. They can come and learn complementary and alternative medicine. Why don't you just come and hang out with the fellows when you have time? So I spent the next four years going to my medical school classes and rotations. And then as soon as I had time going and hanging out with the fellows and learning this broader spectrum, it's where I learned about Qigong and, and energy work. It's where I learned about um, uh, guided imagery and how important the brain is to harness the brain's power in helping our bodies to heal. Um, it's where I learned about um, phytomedicine or using plant chemistry in uh, in medicine and how the plants that are around us can heal us if we understand how to use them medicinally. Um, and so because of that, I kind of became the guy in residency that when a patient would show up to any of the other residents that was using an herb or whatever, they would say, well, I don't know anything about that. Go see Dr. Riggs. He, he's the guy you need to go talk to. And so um, they referred all of those patients to me and I would do two things. Number one, sometimes I could advise them and counsel with them. And sometimes I learned from them, right? As they brought something new to me and they said, Dr. Riggs, I'm, I'm taking this supplement or I'm taking this mineral and I'm taking it for this. I would say, that's interesting. Tell me more about that. Where did that come yeah. from? And they would educate their doctor on, well, I read this and this article and so then I would say, fantastic, I'm going to go look those things up. And the next time you come in, we'll have a conversation about whether or not I'm concerned about it. Is there enough literature out there? Is it going to interact with anything else that we're doing? And so I would go then and spend time on the computer and look up the articles and research and then come back and we would have a conversation. So it was much more of a dialogue than it was kind of this traditional parental role that sometimes medicine is. Yeah, I, I can't tell you how refreshing that is to hear. <laughs> Um, thank you I, I mean seriously I, the, my my head is spinning because there's so many things i want to ask and there's so many rabbit holes i can go down um my first thing is i just want to start cheering I, seriously like <laughs> thank you. To, my favorite thing about well let me how, let me rephrase that my favorite people are people mm -hmm. who are open mm -hmm. who are willing to go i don't necessarily know that let me look into it let me yeah. find out more. Tell me more. You clearly think you know something about this. Let me learn from you. Yeah. And and so I love that. Um, and I think the more people that we can get on this planet who are willing to humble themselves and say that, uh, the better off we will be. Like, yeah. Just, well, you know, to, to that point, Keith, in medicine, the challenge is, is that medicine in, in I think, its best effort 
has made mistakes. I mean, think of all the medications that you're aware of that the FDA has approved, that we've rolled out, that physicians have prescribed, that several years later, we're like, whoa, 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 we got to recall that because it's causing strokes or heart attacks or whatever, right? Right. And it's like, it's okay to just be honest about this. Say, hey, we don't have it right either. So yeah. we don't have a, uh, we're, we don't have the corner on, we do this perfectly. We know what we're doing. We don't. And we, yeah. we in medicine have to just admit that and go, it's okay that we don't know everything. We're going to give it our best effort. We're going to tell you what we do know, or at least what we think we know. And then we may find out later that this is wrong, right? <laughs> yeah. And that's, I mean, that's the human condition, right? That's, that's the same with education, same with religion. Like it's all run yeah. by people right. and people, right. <laughs> people make mistakes. Right. And, and, yep. and I think, I think most people are working with the best of intentions. Yeah. And then I, I, I do think we've run back into that fear thing. The other question I have for you, I guess, and I, it's less of a question and more of a just, uh, how would someone, because when, when my wife had a stroke, we, I was able to get on the phone with Dr. Hill, um, yeah. who you know, and, and yeah. most of the people who listen to this podcast will know, sure. um, and and uh, Andrew Goff. And I was able to get some some information within a few hours to try to help my wife along that journey uh, in mm -hmm. using some alternative methods like essential oils, uh, massage, uh, things like that. And yeah. they gave me a lot of references and a lot of information. And I took that to the doctor and said, hey, you know, this is kind of how our family approaches wellness, and and, and we want to collaborate. We want to work together on this with you. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I I absolutely respect and thank thank God for the surgeon who was able to perform surgery and and save her life and do those things. And now yeah. that we're past that, how can we have this integrative approach? Yeah. And I presented him with about ten or fifteen studies and tabs. I said, I don't know how you want me to do this. So here's my laptop. Every tab is open to something about right. these different tools that I'd like to be able to use. And within about five to ten minutes, he just came back and said, Yeah, we're just we're just we we're not sure that this is the right thing to even consider. And it, it just shut down immediately. Yeah. So when you share your approach, I'm just like, Man, can I get can, can I move to Utah and have you be present when, <laughs> if and when something goes wrong? Right, and, right. But also there's going to be a lot of guys that are listening to this. that are like, I want to take this other approaches. I want to take this integrative approach. I want to not just be told what to do. Yeah. Right. How, how do you think they can approach other physicians who I really believe are doing their best. They're, they're doing the yeah. best they can. They're working within a system that isn't always open to, things that aren't approved there's litigation right. there's insurance like there's all these reasons why yep. which i understand um but what would you how would you recommend someone approach that in a way that they can feel a little bit more empowered mm -hmm. but also feel comfortable that they're making a good choice for themselves yeah yeah i think i think that's a great question and i think it it comes from a relationship of mutual respect right you know, you, you've you've mentioned here that, boy, thank goodness for the surgeon that could take care of your wife mm -hmm. immediately. That goes a long way in any relation. I don't care whether it's physician-patient relationship. I don't care what it is. Um, but to just come with the respect of, I am so appreciative of what you know, and I'm so appreciative of what you bring to the table and your knowledge. Thank you for the sacrifice of all those years of schooling and residency and all of that to help me and my family in our, in our time of crises. And hopefully you have a strong enough relationship with that physician that they also have some respect for you and your family mm. and can say, yeah, I I'm, I'm glad to be here. I have respect for you and your family. Uh, and, and then that begins the conversation when, when a physician comes, you know, sometimes a physician will come to the patient with the attitude of, I know best. You just have to mm -hmm. listen to me. And sometimes patients, just to be fair, come to us with the attitude of, I know best. You just need to do what I want you to do. It's like, well, that did, that is not set up for a great relationship. Right. There's no respect on either side. It's that I know better and you don't know anything. So do what I want you to do. It's not great. So when we can approach each other with respect and just say, my hat is off to the things that you know, please help me understand more about that and help me understand i always say push back a little bit when a physician says no i don't think we're going to go that way say help me understand why yeah. not not 
no, or I can't believe you're shutting me down, but just say, help me understand why. What, what was, what did the research tell you that maybe I'm not seeing? And I'd, I'd like to know more about what it is that you're seeing that I'm not through yeah. what you just read. So that then it begins a conversation. And to your point of power, I just gave a lecture when I was in Florida last week and talked about healthcare. Patients too often give away their power when they walk into a doctor's office. Mm-hmm. And, and I think that that's a, a shame. And, and yes, there's responsibility in the doctor to empower the patient, but it's also a responsibility for the patient to say, I- I'm in charge of my health. I'm not giving away that power to anybody. My health is mine. And so I'm here to get counsel. I'm here to get advice. I'm not here to get directions, but I- I'm here to counsel with you. And you're going to tell me from your perspective, the things that I should do. And then I'm going to evaluate that counsel and decide for myself if that's counsel that I want. Maybe it is, maybe it isn't. Maybe maybe for this, I don't feel like what I'm being told is the direction that I want to move. I respect it, but I'm going to go see an acupuncturist for this particular problem. And then they go see an acupuncturist. Or I don't think that uh, taking anti-inflammatories is going to be helpful for me, but a massage therapist will probably be helpful for me in dealing with this. And so then you're still, you have all the power, it's yours. Don't ever give that away because you should decide for yourself. And from a sort of meta meta spiritual standpoint, I believe that we have a voice inside each of us that we should be listening to. And if we don't know how to listen to it, we should hone that skill to listen to what am I being told? What is the voice in me saying is the right thing for me to do, whether it's health, dealing with my family, dealing with my spouse, uh, job, if I can listen to me, if I can listen to that inner voice, I really believe that will guide me to the best place. Yeah, that's so good. Um, the first thing that, that made me think of when you talked about that mutual respect between you know patient and physician was relationship Mm -hmm. and relationship requires me coming to see like me as a, as a, an adult male coming to see you without having to be told by my wife, (laughs) like (laughs) as it takes some, I have to be a little proactive, right? Like I can't just show up every five years and be like, Hey, Dr. Riggs is what we're doing Right. Uh, to develop that. It requires a relationship. Yeah. Right. And I think that's one of the big things that, that, a lot of men fail to see is that the best, one of the best ways, maybe not the best, but one of the best ways we can love on our wife and our kids and our partners and our communities is by taking care of ourselves. Yeah. Like showing up when my wife had her stroke, my immediate thought was I'm going to be a single father of eight kids. Right. I need to get my ass to the gym. Yeah. I need to be, I, and if she does survive, will she be functioning? Will I have to carry her to the shower? Will I have to? And Mm -hmm. it like struck me, like I am not physically prepared to take on what life might throw at me. And it was a huge wake up call for me. Right. I need to get, I need to get healthier. And and I thought I was pretty healthy, but you know, there was weight to be lost and there was things that could be done differently, you know? And so just thankfully she's, she's amazing. She's great. She recovered really well. Um, yeah. and I don't have to carry her anywhere. <laughs> so right. that's well, good. and to your to your point, Keith, you know, it's interesting because often women will joke. Let's say that the woman has four children with her spouse, and she's like, Well, I've got four kids and with my husband five. Because she is sometimes taking on that parental role of go see the doctor, you know, yeah, all those things, right? Please don't go eat out all the time, etc. It's like, look, you're my wife. Why should why am I doing the things that are making you take on a parental role with me? Yeah. I should respect you and love you and support you enough that I'm going to be responsible for myself and I'm going to go do these things. I'll call the doctor and make my annual appointment to go get a physical, make sure I'm going to be okay and make sure that I'm going to be around for you and our kids and our grandkids and be able to do all those things that we imagine that we're going to do. But instead, sometimes we let our wives take care of that and worry about, us and our health yeah Yeah, and it it is there's a better way yeah (laughs) there's a better way for us to behave right Right. take ownership and accountability of those things (laughs) 
Accountab- that's the word that was just ringing through. I mean, I love your description of it, Keith. And Dr. Riggs, what you're saying, the whole time you're talking, I'm like, okay, but <laughs> convince a man to start taking accountability for some stuff. Like that can be mm-hmm. really difficult if he's not to a place where he is willing to step into that yet. Yeah. It, can be, it can be scary. It can be daunting. There may be generational stuff that he's working through. There might be a lot of different things in life that um, I, I think men are we'll just say it here. Like it's easy to go to work. Like we talk about how hard we work as men, but it's, it's easy to get out and leave. It's difficult to deal with all the different emotions that kids would have in a specific day at all the different age ranges for a family Mm -hmm. that has multiple children. It's difficult to make, you know, the food choices, how am I nourishing them? How am I navigating? How am I doing the bill? Like, that's hard. That's, I've been telling my wife, we've been having these chats. I'm like, I kind of sort of want to just like our roles have reversed within the last year a little bit. And I'm like, Oh, some days I just want to get out and go to work. Like, right. Right. We're wired that way. Just as a, as a, a a funny learning experience for myself early in my practice, when a woman would come to see me for the first time and we're getting to know each other and asking the questions of, do you smoke and do you drink? And if so, how much? And all those things that we ask, right. Family history, all those things. I used to ask the question, do you work? Mm. Can you imagine how insulting that is to a mother who's has, a, she's a stay at home mom with children. Yeah. Do you work like really? And so I had, again, you learn from your patients. I had this wonderful patient who was very kind and she corrected me. She says, you mean, do I work outside of the home? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yes, that is what I mean. You're <laughs> correct because you do mm-hmm. work. And you do probably some of the hardest work there is. So thank you for that. And so now the question is, do you work outside of the home? Because I know you work at home. (laughs) I love it. We learned the same lesson. I've had to update that on my life insurance applications when I was working with people. Yeah. For the homemaker, you know, they're like, well, I don't know. Yeah. Do you work outside the home? That (laughs) that saved me a lot. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. For sure. It's an interesting sort of statement on stereotypes too, Mm -hmm. you know. Because John and I both are more at home than at work. And right. we both have large families. We both homeschool. So it's, I think yeah. we have a very different perspective on a lot of how those things function, um, which is good because it allows us to be in a place where we can have these conversations in a little bit different way. And I think, right. you know, John, your point is, you know, it is hard to sit in those conversations and and to be there and to be emotionally present for your kids and to lean into those things. And I think one of the things that I've learned is how, like, you know, we view success in financial terms, often titles, Mm -hmm. money, Mm -hmm. assets. Um, And I used to look at things that way until we, we built this network marketing business that we were able to, to have time freedom. Yeah. And the value I put on time now, especially when you're faced with, you know, the potential loss of your spouse to go, man, I'll, I'll take every day I can get. And, and yeah. how do I use that time? Right. And so I'm kind of curious um, for, for me, Dr. Riggs, that kind of lends into like the mental health side of things uh-huh. and, and how much you talked about um, very briefly. And I love to dive into this a little bit is like how the brain helps us to heal but mm-hmm. also how the stresses of day to day help make us sick. It's um, true. And I'd love to talk a little bit about what what's what are some of your recommendations or some of the things that you see that can help people manage that mental stress and what that can manifest physically. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's a that's a great question. I you mentioned something there though. There's a quote that came to mind by a gentleman by the name of David O. McKay. And he said, no success can compensate for failure in the home. So you, you, you can be making millions of dollars so a year. And if your home is falling apart, your marriage, your children, et cetera, that success means nothing, nothing. When, when your children are struggling and your family is struggling. So, so yeah, let, let's talk about the brain and kind of what it does for us. <laughs> because there is a lot that happens to the body when the brain perceives a threat, okay? So that could be, uh, um, uh, and I say perceives a threat because 
it could be a real threat, meaning uh, somebody, I'm, I'm, I like to backpack. I'm backpacking and there's a bear on the path in front of me. Real threat, real things are happening. And my body now all of a sudden, there's physiologic and chemical changes that happen with my body, right? Cortisol goes way up. Blood is shunted from my GI tract, so I'm no longer digesting food. It goes to the muscles. My eyes dilate, right? My pupils dilate, so as much light as is there can get in. Um, my muscles actually start to twitch because I've got to be ready, and they know my, I've got to be ready to run. My pulse goes up. My um, blood pressure goes up. So physiologically, things change in my body. The same exact physiologic response happens when I'm sitting at my desk and I get an email from my boss that says, we've just changed the deadline on your project. It's a week <laughs> earlier. Exact same things happen. Wow. That's right? fascinating. The, the brain cannot tell the difference between those two things. It only knows to respond to stress one way. And that's what happens to us. And when we're constantly in that high amount of stress, um, which can happen with sometimes home life, sometimes work life, uh, et cetera. Now, all of a sudden, cortisol is high all the time in our body. When cortisol is high, blood sugar is high. When blood sugar is high, insulin is high. And when we bathe ourselves in insulin, insulin is a type of growth hormone. And at one point, we stop growing this way, and we only grow in one other direction. <laughs> And so high stress can lead to all sorts of chronic issues that we're going to be dealing with for years and years and years if we don't know how to handle stress. How do we, how do we access homeostasis? We, sometimes we can't avoid stress. I mean, remember a conversation with a, with a mother who had four children under the age of five, right? So Ooh. maybe you guys have dealt with that, but kids and and it was like she had a high amount of stress and we talked about her stress and how it was leading to some health conditions and she's like so what do I do I can't I can't sell my kids and you're like right so since we can't deal with the stressor we can't remove the stressor all we can do is say well how am I going to respond to the stressor what things can I do to help me stay out of the fight or flight and stay more into the the feed or breed this other part of the of the nervous system where i'm calmer and so we talked about things like energy work guided imagery meditation which i highly highly recommend so that when we're triggered by the email by the bear by the children whatever it is we can go okay i feel what's going on with my body i'm going to take some deep breaths and then because i've been practicing meditation now my body goes, oh, oh, we're deep breathing. Oh, we know what to do. The blood pressure comes down, the pulse comes down, and we're able to reset and go back into homeostasis because we've practiced it, right? Yeah. The system uh, begins to recognize those triggers. I have a question about that. Um, yeah. I've been told mm -hmm. uh, by various people that when you're working out, you're doing the things you're supposed to do, and you're not able to lose weight, Mm -hmm. that that weight is probably protection. It's a, like an emotional response to protection. But yeah. what you're saying, and, and, and it makes sense, but what you're saying is that under stress, your cortisol and your insulin are up. Uh -huh. And so you can't grow taller. You're going to grow out. Right. So it's less a protection from something like an emotional thing. It's more what you're, what you're suggesting, I think I'm hearing you say, is that it's also attached to what is the level of stress that you have in your life and Correct. if you reduce that that last bit of weight or that that protective weight would be able to fall off easier right. not that we're trying to push weight loss of any sort but right right yeah okay Correct. it's 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 the concept of our body goes through that response because we need to when there's the bear on the trail in the mm -hmm. forest we need to be able to respond quickly. As a matter of fact, unfortunately, at those times, we actually don't access the cerebral cortex, the outer part of the brain that makes us human. We make decisions from the amygdala, called the amygdala hijack, 
that we don't yeah. ever access the other side of the brain, which says, is this a smart plan? I'm not sure it is, right? But the yep. issue is, is that then when we're dealing with this stress, when it's not the bear in the forest, when it's the 30 emails that we got today before lunch, when it's the stress of home, when it's the finances of, oh my gosh, my house is in foreclosure, or they're going to repo the car, or all of those things, the body responds exactly the same way. It responds in a way that's meant to protect us from life-threatening things. And then we don't make better decisions. We don't yeah. until we can get the system to calm back down. And now we can access that cerebral cortex and go, okay, let's really evaluate what's going on. Right? Yeah. And if we're in that amygdala hijack, we're making other choices. What I often refer to as like micro decisions, right? Like I'm stressed <laughs> out, I'm scared. And so I'm going to comfort myself with food. Or I'm gonna make a I'm gonna make this tiny choice. I'm gonna skip the gym because I just need a rest. Right. And it's like really that extra hour of sleep isn't doing you any good. Right. Getting to the gym would be better. And then these micro decisions stack on top of each other. And you know, it's it's slight edge principles, right? One degree off course and you end up in a whole different right. a whole different landing zone. Yeah. Um, so mindfulness, meditation. Yeah. You've mentioned brain imagery or guided imagery guided imagery a few times can you walk us through what sure. you mean specifically about that yeah for sure so guided imagery is something that i was taught by dr weil and really it's harnessing the power of the brain and its connection to the body so for instance um when i was in my fourth year of medical school i was meeting with a patient with the fellows in the complementary and alternative medicine department who had cancer and we were teaching the concept of guided imagery and this guy was a scuba diver and so we okay. said so let's talk about your immune system because we know the immune system is very strong at detecting cancer and killing cancer cells we we all get cancer quite frequently by the way all of us do. I've heard that. I've heard this. It's yeah. a little scary, but I've heard. It is. I know. Like when, when a, I've heard, I heard that when a man dies, there's mm -hmm. anywhere from like one to five cancers in their body. Yep. And yep. that we, they wouldn't even know. Correct. That scares so, the crap out of me on this <laughs> level. And then over here, I'm like, my body's good. God's got right. me. It's right. doing what it's supposed to do. That's right. Exactly right. So, so because our immune system is, is really amazing and we don't really understand a, a ton of it yet, but our immune system goes through our system and checks the body and says, is this our cell? Is this our cell? Is this our cell? Oh, this one looks weird. We should get rid of it. And so it mounts an immune response against a cell, a cancer cell before it ever turns into something that we would even be aware of. Right? So we know that the immune system has a function that it does this through something called natural killer cells. And so as we're talking with this patient, we said, um, let's use some guided imagery for this. What is the most aggressive thing that you can think of? And he said, sharks. I've dealt with sharks as I scuba dive. I have great respect for them. I have respect for their power. I, I'm not afraid of them. I think they're incredible creatures. And they are very powerful. You're like, great. So imagine your immune system and your immune cells are sharks. And they're swimming through your body looking for cancer cells. And as they find a cancer cell, they attack it as sharks do. And they get rid of that cancer. And we want you to spend 10 to 15 minutes morning and evening just sitting there thinking about that. And what we know now from scientific research is that as we do things like that, we use guided imagery in our body, that the body responds. It changes its physiology based upon what we're thinking and how we're thinking about this. And it starts to do things. It's, it's incredible, the power of the brain. We even, this, this was done back in the 1970s. I'm sure before there were ethics in study participants, but they used to take <laughs> they used to take study participants and they would they would tell them that they were about to touch them with a hot piece of metal on their hand and they would have their hand underneath a, a, 
a, a wall where they couldn't see what was going on with the hand. And then they would touch the hand with an ice cube and the skin would blister up and burn just as if a hot poker had touched the hand because their brain was convinced what they were experiencing was a hot poker. And so it responded, their body responded as it would if hot metal was touching their hand, not ice. And so yeah. we know that the brain changes physiology and how we respond to things and how our system can react to things around us. So that's kind of what guided imagery is, just using the power of the brain in our health. That's all. That's just just a little thing. Well, most powerful tool we <laughs> know about. It's pretty cool. <laughs> it's it's super fascinating. It, and it, it's triggering memories I have of things that throughout my life that we've not used that tool specifically or, or that phrasing uh, specifically, mm -hmm. but through meditation and through other things. Um, understanding like if we say, oh, I'm always sick or my kids are always getting sick, then guess what? Your kids are always getting sick. Right. Versus, right. you know, hey, our kids are healthy and they're strong and they're fit. And every once in a while, something might happen, but we have tools to use. Like, it's just, it's a mindset shift. Yeah. Um, the, it's, the, even, it, it's along the same principles of faith, right? Mm -hmm. it, it's along those same principles of, I believe in something and therefore it changes my world around me. To your point of talk positively and the universe responds yeah. in positive ways. Talk negatively all the time universe responds right yeah i remember my kids did a science experiment with rice where mm -hmm. you take like two two cups of cooked rice and you put them in mason jars and then you put them in separate rooms where they can't hear each other mm -hmm. and you like talk down to one and you talk up to the other mm -hmm. and the one that you talk up to doesn't grow mold and the one you talk down to will start to go moldy really fast That's it's just so cool. really, it's just really fun science that you can do with your kids <laughs> and it's like, you can do a plant, you can do it, but, but it's, it's a hundred percent true. Like that yeah. energy behind positive talk, negative talk, anger, kindness, all those things, right. Yeah. Shift. Um, so in your practice, yep. how comfortable or how, like, what's the ratio of, you know, somebody comes in, they've got a cold, they've got a thing, they've got an illness. I mm. mean, do you give them sort of like the the menu of which way do you want to take this? Do you want to just go take a, a pharmaceutical? Do you want to try this over here? Do you want to, maybe you need some breathe oil? <laughs> like what's the. Right. It's, it's a great question. I, I try to meet patients where they are on their journey. Um, and then because if, if I take someone who is completely in the pharmaceutical world and just say, Nope, I'm never giving you a pharmaceutical. I'm only going to give you natural stuff. They're not going to come and see me again. Mm -hmm. So we begin back to our relationship conversation. We begin developing a relationship. And so, for instance, let's just, we'll talk about the diabetic, for instance. So the, the when the diabetic comes to me, we diagnose them and they are squarely in this pharmaceutical mindset. We use pharmaceuticals right off the bat. It's just That's what they expect. That's what they want. That's what they're here for. And then over time, as I'm seeing them over time and we begin having conversation and they begin to trust me and I begin to know them, then we begin moving slowly into, hey, let's talk about your lifestyle for a minute. We have a strong enough relationship now. Let's talk about what are the things that you're eating? Whereas if I would have done that on visit one, it, it wouldn't have happened. They wouldn't have changed. They would have been yeah. frustrated, right? It's the same concept of, Think about people that smoke, right? Mm -hmm. They're smoking, they're smoking, they're smoking. How many times have they heard from their doctor, you need to quit smoking, it's bad for you? Right. It's a very different conversation when your 19-year-old daughter comes to you and says, Dad, mm -hmm. I love you. I want you to be around for my wedding and I want you to be around for my kids. And if you don't stop smoking, I'm worried you won't be. Yeah. So can you just stop smoking? Because... I need you and I want you here. It's the same concept, but two different relationships having that conversation. And so yeah. I meet people where they are and then try to move them towards middle ground. I do the same with people that are squarely in this camp. 
-hmm. And they say, I'm never going to use a pharmaceutical. You say, okay, we've got lots of options within that world. And you develop the relationship so that when the time comes, or if the time comes, where they absolutely need one, you can say, you know how I am. You know that it's not my go-to to just do pharmaceuticals. But in this case, we need to use something. I'm very yeah. worried about you and what the outcome is going to be if we don't get on top of this. And then hopefully by that time, the relationship is strong enough that they say, I trust you, Dr. Riggs. I think if that's what you're counseling me to do, then great. Because I think my opinion is our best health is actually middle of the road. Mm. Very rarely are things good for us that are at either extreme. <laughs> okay. You know, whether yeah. it be pharmaceutical, non pharmaceutical, whether it be foods, you know, I think we're best served middle of the road, respecting the fact that there's a time and a place for most things, right? Yeah. Um, and so if, if we can recognize that and go, okay, this is the time in which I should not be using a med. This is a time where I should be looking more at an oil, an herb, a lifestyle change, et cetera. Then great. That's wonderful. Yeah. Right. Um, I love so, that. Yeah. That's kind of my approach to patients in that regards. Yeah. I go ahead, John. I was going to say, I'm glad we circled back to that because I know, um, I think I've shared with you briefly before that we've, in real, we have three A's that we focus on, awareness, accountability, and action. Mm -hmm. And it sounds like what I was hearing you say early on was how important accountability is, especially when the man's coming in to see you, sit with you, everything else. Would you agree that if that man has not first also had some level of awareness, and I would even get more specific self-awareness prior right. to that appointment, and then being willing to take accountability, it might just be near impossible to ever get right uh, an action that's going to move the needle for him in a good direction so that yeah. that awareness piece and you guys just kind of hit on that it's like it's everything that's, yeah is yeah that yeah for sure i i remember one night <clears throat> about 10 years ago i was a medical director of a nursing home and it was probably eight o'clock at night i had one of my own patients i've been working with for seven or eight years on controlling his diabetes. And we were admitting him from the nursing home, from the hospital to the nursing home. So he had to stay in the hospital for about a week and a half. Now he's admitted to the nursing home because we have had to amputate his left leg below the knee. Mm -hmm. Now, before that, he'd had an amputation of some toes. He'd had an amputation of a right foot. Uh, he had an amputation of a left foot. And now we had to amputate the rest of the leg below the knee. <clears throat> and as I'm admitting him to the nursing home, he said, you know, Dr. Riggs, I probably ought to get this diabetes under control. <laughs> and you're like, that's a good plan. I think that's wonderful. And his habit was eating a half gallon of ice cream every single night. Wow. Right? And you just go, okay, so... You know, to your point, John, there had he had not taken accountability for himself for so long, and it had taken such drastic things to finally get his attention to where he said, "Yep, this is probably now where I ought to be accountable for this, and I ought to make sure that I'm doing better at this." And you're like, "It's okay. I mean, if that was your wake up, great. We all have them. We all get to decide when our wake up will be, whether it's our health, whether it's." our spirituality, whether it's our family, whether it's our marital relationships, but at some point we are all going to have to wake up and realize I got to be accountable. And if I'm going to be accountable, it's going to require some behavior change. I've got to do some action that is going to be different from here on out, because yeah. for me, I want this to be my rock bottom. I don't want to go any deeper into whatever the consequences are of what I'm dealing with. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And about the respect piece, too. I think that the respect piece could be a bit more challenging. And tell me if this is accurate. If you've got patients that are not necessarily willing to respect their doctor, are they not also probably the same people that are not respecting themselves? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. Have they lost? And I think if we've learned anything post pandemic has been like, we have so much less respect for each other in the human race. Um, we're letting division drive families apart, break up, like, Wow. So the, the self-respect to come back with would do a lot of us some some good, especially us men. And then we can step into a good, solid conversation with another man face to face and take 
construction, cr constructive criticism, open feedback, and and dialogue versus just a silly screaming match and acting like children. Right. Right. Yep. Yeah. For sure. Yeah, I think we've lost sight of the reality that we all have impact on one another, the way we interact mm -hmm. with each other, right? And we get to choose whether that impact is positive, negative, or neutral. Yeah. And, and it's just very rarely ever neutral, you know? Yeah. And 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 so, you know, I, I laughed because, you know, you, you're that patient, you're sharing his story, you know, at one point he ends up in a wheelchair, which means someone's got to push him around or someone's yeah. got to help him get from A to B. Yep. And there's services that have to be implemented to help him, I imagine, with all these things. And and yeah, to your point, John, it's that respect factor of like my lifestyle choices are impacting my family, my friends, strangers, you know, that's yeah. an interesting it's, dynamic uh, when you look at it through that lens. It's it's interesting because there is a, in medicine, physicians tend to get frustrated with their patients when they're non-compliant. We call it non-compliant. <laughs> I, I try to foster a concept of be curious, not furious. Like, oh, interesting. I like that. Yeah. In, investigate the behavior with the patient, right? Don't, don't be frustrated with them. They're, they are doing their best, even if they're not doing the things that you recommended, even to the detriment of their health and begin to get curious about their behavior. I, I had a, a patient who was not doing the things that we had talked about for a very long time. She wasn't implementing some of the lifestyle changes that she wanted, that, that we had talked about and that she had committed to. And so we began exploring, tell me more about this. Tell me more about, you know, why we're choosing to continue this behavior, right? And really, as I listened to her, and it took about a half hour, I began to realize what self-deprecating talk that she had. Mm -hmm. She did not think very highly of herself at all. And so we started investigating that. I started asking more questions along those lines. And it was interesting to watch her husband, who of adored her. She's an older patient. They've been married for a very long time. And to listen to her start describe her inner dialogue wow. of the things that she tells herself every day, he was so sad to hear how she thought of herself. And so you could tell this wasn't coming from him. This wasn't the, the discussion that he had been having with her. It came from actually her childhood. Sure. But I realized we're never going to get the behavior change that we need until she realizes that she's worth investing in. We yeah. don't invest in, I mean, think about money investment, right? We don't invest in things that we know are going to fail. Yeah. It's like, Oh, sure. I'll throw money at that. It's fine. We invest in things that have value to us that we think are going to bring more value to us. And if I think horribly of myself, I'm not going to spend a lot of energy on taking care of myself. Yeah. And so we spent the next three months working on that thing. We started talking about some positive affirmations. We started talking about doing some cognitive behavioral therapy. She saw a counselor. We started working with a, a book called um, uh, Feeling Good, New Mood Therapy by Dr. David Burns, which I, I love his information in there. And begin to help her realize the distortions that she had in her thought so that then she could start thinking better about herself. Once, and we completely set aside, by the way, the disease we were dealing with. We didn't even mention it once for like three yeah. or five months. Once we got her to where she was feeling better about herself, now the work on taking care of herself became so much easier because yeah. she felt better. She felt like she was worth investing in. Yeah, wow. that's so good. And that's root cause, right? You're, you're, right. The, the disease is the symptom yeah, correct. of something else, right? Yeah. And and that's one of one of my favorite things to dive into with people when I get the opportunity to coach or mentor or work with them is, is yes, there's this problem that you have, this thing that you want to address, but nine times out of 10, that's a symptom of something deeper. We got to keep peeling back. We got to figure out what that is. Yeah. And I met with a guy yesterday who had some challenges and asked me if I'd help him. And I didn't know what I was walking into. He's just, he's a good friend of mine. And I said, yes, you need time. Let's talk. And he dropped some pretty heavy stuff. And it was like, okay, 
I didn't see this coming. And let's let's get into it. Like, what's the expectation? How can I help you? Yeah. And, you know, I just start peeling back to get to the root of it. And he was like, no, no, no. It's just this one thing. And I'm like, no, it's no. I love you. I love you too much to let you think that that's true. Right. <laughs> it isn't this. <laughs> we got to get to here because it's something else. Yeah. <laughs> that's so good, man. I have I have absolutely adored talking. This has been so much fun. Would yeah. you... um? I'm wondering if you have like off the top of your head, top three things that men should be doing to take care of themselves, whatever you think those are. Um, From a medical standpoint, get an annual physical. I actually had a patient once asked me, Dr. Ricks, how often should I get an annual physical? (laughs) Well, we could do it yearly. I I don't know. Yearly would be great. Right. Yearly. Um, because you need to know your numbers. You need to know your blood pressure. You need to know your weight. You need to know your blood sugar. You need to know your cholesterol because you don't want to know them after there's the problem. Mm-hmm. You want to know them to see, is there a trend? Am I heading towards something that I can do something, Some to your point earlier, some 1% change and avoid a monumental change later? Yeah, right? I love so that. know your numbers can be very helpful. Number two is invest in relationships. (laughs) Um, The number one predictor of how long you will live has nothing to do with exercise or nutrition. It has to do with healthy relationships. Come on. No kidding. Science has proven this. So you want a long, healthy life? Invest in relationships. Your relationship with your spouse, your relationship with your family, um, your relationship with friends, right? Invest in those things because they pay off huge dividends as we get older, right? Um, so those are the first two things. The third thing, um, I, I guess I would say probably move more. Mm-hmm. We tend to spend a lot of energy in finding the closest parking lot at work or parking spot at work. We mm-hmm. spend a lot of energy driving around the parking lot when we're going shopping to find the closest parking spot to the mall or to the grocery store, wherever we are. Why do we spend so much energy doing that? It's okay to walk. It's okay to move more. It's okay to, to do those things. And I think many of those things, by the way, can be combined. One of my favorite things to do is particularly when the weather is nicer than it's going to be. We were talking earlier about our winter storm coming in, but right. when when the weather is going to be nice, um, my favorite thing to do is go hiking with my kids. Yeah, right? same. Particularly one-on-one because okay. it's a little bit different in a group dynamic, but when mm-hmm. you can spend one-on-one time with your kids in nature, the conversation led by them gets to be extremely and profoundly impactful when they tell you the things that are on their heart what's most important to them what are they worried about what do they love about their life um it's great feedback for you as a dad to hear those things of yeah you know how am i doing as a parent asking the question are there things i could be doing better Mm -hmm. you know sometimes making meaningful apologies to our children Mm-hmm. of maybe decisions that we made in our fight or flight response when they came home at 2 a.m. and curfew is midnight and just saying, yeah, you're, you're right. I did lose it on you. That wasn't right. I'm sorry. You know? Yeah. Uh, Man, the ability are... for a, a dad to say, I'm sorry to their kid is huge. Yeah. yeah. So good. And, and to be brave enough to put yourself in a position to ask the question, how am I doing? Because uh-huh. you're opening yourself right. up to hear, you're not doing so great this week. <laughs> right. Yeah. Right. Right. And and by the way, for you guys that are a little bit younger than me, that doesn't change when they become adults. Oh, 100%. <laughs> I recently took my 25-year-old to lunch and we had a conversation. He told me some of the things. And then I took that dad responsibility to say, yeah, but what about this, 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 this? And then I got the text, you know, a couple of days later after he cooled off and digested. And he's like, dad, I was aware of those things. I didn't need you to tell me. I needed you to be happy of the changes I was making. Yeah. Like, thank you. You were right. I I should have known and trusted that you knew to still work on those things. I am sorry I didn't celebrate with you your wins. Yeah. I I apologize. 
at 25, right? Yeah. So that's beautiful though. Yeah, and you're reminding me and kind of solidifying in some things I heard just in the last few weeks about how critical it is to shift from this mindset or this false mindset of our over filtered and what seems to be perfect worlds that people put out socially and publicly. But this remove yourself from this concept of perfection and moving closer towards pure. Mm -hmm. and i've been focused on that for the last few weeks and it's been amazing just what that's done for my mindset so that's what i'm hearing you say it's like it's okay to apologize it's okay to tell your son you are not perfect i'm working on being pure in my mind pure in my heart surrounding myself with people who are pure and care about others like that that to me feels so good and so healthy and it's made it easier for me to apologize yeah i i, I used to tell my kids well still do even as they're older now but i would say you know, it's your first time being 12 years old. So it's okay. You made a mistake. Mm -hmm. By the way, it's my first time being the dad of a 12 year old. So I'm going to mistakes. I'm going to make mistakes too. I don't know any more what I'm doing than you do because this is your first time and it's my first time. So we're going to get through this together yeah. and I'm going to accept that you're going to make some mistakes and please accept that I'm going to make some mistakes and we're going to try to be open and honest with each other when we make those mistakes and it's going to be okay. Yeah. If we just realize that, right? Yeah. So I had the same conversation with my 23 year old a couple of weeks ago when I was checking in on him and he said, dad, I'm just trying to figure out how to be 23. And I said, that's good. Cause I'm trying to figure out how to be the father of a 23 year old. <laughs> we're in the same boat. We're, we're yep. let's just, let's remember to be kind to one another and, and give each other grace. And we're in good company, right? Here. Yeah. Yeah. It's like, we're all just figuring it out. It's our first right. time in all this. This, is so great. Exactly. this has been awesome, man. This has been so good. You've dropped all sorts of, I've gotten, I've got two pages of notes and we were just having a conversation. I do, I do too. <laughs> this has been great. And I hope anybody listening has been taking notes because this Thank has been you. some great stuff, man. I'm super grateful for you. Thank you so much. Um, I could keep going, but I want to honor your time and, and Thank you. the time of our listeners. And so um, we've got book recommendations. We've got quotes. We've got health <laughs> recommendations. This has been amazing. Very Thank kind. So Would much. be happy to come back anytime. Really uh, um, admire what you're doing in the world. You know, as we as we all link arms to be a force for good, um, no matter what our particular um, expertise or what our particular calling is, as we link arms to be a force for good, we change the world. Um, that's that's we do that one person at a time that doesn't happen yep. in massive movements of thousands it's touching the heart of one and then we change and remembering the times where that's happened to us where we've changed from an individual reaching out and touching us and so i applaud what you're doing very grateful thank you thank you that's thank you that means a lot man we will definitely have you back Absolutely. perfect believe Good that thank you, um, yeah thank you so much you bet.